Before I begin my sermon this morning, I just want to say real quick that I just feel a sense of, of joy and contentment to be here with you this morning. Did you feel that in the room this morning? So I want to thank you. I want to thank you as the church body for worshiping together with me. I want to thank our leaders for leading us into a meaningful and purposeful worship service together. Amen? Amen. So my name is Zane McGee. Um, I've shared with you before, and Don's traveling again, so I'm going to be sharing a word with you this morning as well. And we're going to be continuing our lesson series on looking at the Gospel of John. And specifically what we're looking at in this Gospel is how it is that persons in the stories that we read of this Gospel respond to Jesus' ministry. Because we're in this time of year that is traditionally known as Advent. And so we've talked about that what Advent means is it's a reflection or an anticipation of the coming of the King. And so it looks forward to December 25th, where we celebrate Christmas, the birth of Christ. And so instead of looking at the gospel narratives that look at the anticipation of Jesus' birth, we instead are focusing on the responses of people to adult Jesus and to his ministry as he reveals himself to be the Messiah. And so we're going to pick that up today with John chapter 2, looking at the story of the wedding in Cana. And so we're in a time of year right now, not only of Christmas, but this is really kind of a whole holiday season. Right? It begins with Halloween, and it moves through Halloween, and Thanksgiving, and Christmas, and culminates in the New Year. This is a time that kids love, because they're out of school a lot, and any time you can miss school, it's great. It's a time that maybe parents dread a little bit, because their kids don't have school, and so they're home with them a lot. But, for me personally, this is also an important period of the year, because last week, December 8th, I celebrated 12 years of marriage with my wife. So, thank you. That applause all goes to her because every year I have one standard line that I give her on our anniversary, and it's congratulations for putting up with me for one more year. So, she earns, she earns all of that applause. But as I was reflecting back on our anniversary, I was thinking about our wedding day and the events of our wedding day. And while there are many fond and exciting memories from that day, there's also one memory that stood out to me. And our wedding was in the afternoon, and so what that meant was that there was not a lot of pressure on me as the groom that morning. So I woke up and had a very casual, leisurely morning. I was staying at a friend's house who was an elder at the church, and his wife was amazingly generous to myself and my groomsman that was staying with me. She made us breakfast. We had pancakes. We had eggs and sausage. We stuffed ourselves. And after a hearty meal, we retired to the lounge to engage in a serious game of Wii Tennis and Wii Golf. And we played Wii Sports for about an hour. And while we were playing Wii Sports, the wife of the elder came in and said, I thought one of you should know that your cell phone, one of the cell phones in the bedroom has been ringing for quite a while, and maybe someone should check it. And I thought that that's probably not the best sign ever. So I went to my, my room. I picked up my phone, and sure enough, it was my phone that had been ringing. I'm not sure of the exact number of phone calls, but I think it's safe to say that a plethora of missed calls were on my phone. And that a plethora of missed calls on your wedding day is not what you want from your bride-to-be. So I hesitantly called her back, anticipating that this was perhaps the runaway bride phone call. <laughs> and that at least she had done the courtesy to call me and tell me before I got my tux on. But luckily it was not. But what it was was her calling to say that she and her bridal party had been outside of the church building where we were to be married and couldn't get inside because all of the doors were locked and whoever was supposed to let them in hadn't arrived. And keep in mind, this is December 8th in Oklahoma. And so it's not the best time to be walking around a large church building trying every door hoping that you can find one unlocked. To make matters a little worse, the elder who had a key to the church building was the same elder with whom I happened to be staying. And it was the same elder with whom I happened to be playing Wii Sports at that very moment. So, both of us were in a little bit of trouble that day. But what the story reminds me of in thinking about it is that even the biggest events of our life that we plan for can sometimes go wrong. That even the tiniest unexpected thing can come into our plans and it can throw off what it is that we think we are planning to do and how it's going to happen. And so that's exactly the story that we pick up in John chapter 2 at the wedding of Cana. Is that this wedding finds itself in almost the same situation that I did. That they have prepared a wedding event and something has gone wrong and they're unprepared with how to deal with it. And so looking at verses 1 and 2, they introduce this story to us. And so John chapter 2 verses 1 and 2 tell us that this wedding takes place in, this, in the village of Cana. 
and that Mary was a guest at the wedding and that Jesus and the disciples were with her. I want us to spend just a moment thinking about how this story is set up for us in the gospel before we go into the details of it. Because we talked about last week that Nathaniel doubted whether Jesus was the Messiah for one main reason. And the reason that Nathaniel doubted was that because nothing good ever comes from Nazareth. Right. And we discussed last week that Nazareth was a city of unimportance. That Nazareth was, was a city that was common. It wasn't a place where you would expect the Messiah to come from. And so the village of Cana is actually in a quite similar situation. The village of Cana is an unimportant common city. It's not the city where if you were going to begin your, your ministry of revealing to the world that you are the coming Messiah, you wouldn't start it in Cana. Jerusalem, perhaps. But Cana is not where you would begin your story. And the other thing that we miss in this story when we read it is that to us as Christian readers reading this in our New Testament, Jesus is the main character of this story. But the story itself tells us from the very beginning that Mary was the guest at the wedding and that Jesus and the disciples were with her. And so the people who we are paying attention to are actually minor characters in the events that are unfolding. And so what the Gospel of John sets us up to expect from this story is that it's a common village... It's a common event, a wedding, and Jesus and his disciples are common guests. There is nothing about this story that sets us up to expect anything spectacular. And so we're going to pick up in verse 3. And verse 3 picks up after introducing that Jesus and his disciples were at the wedding. And it says, The wine supply at the wedding ran out during the festivities. So Jesus' mother told him, They have no more wine. Dear woman, that's not our problem, Jesus replied. My time has not yet come. But his mother told the servants, do whatever he tells you. And so standing nearby, there were six stone water jars used for Jewish ceremonial washing. Each could hold 20 to 30 gallons. And Jesus told his servants, fill the jars with water. When the jars had been filled, he said, now draw some out and take it to the master of ceremonies. So the servants followed his instructions. When the masters of ceremonies tasted the water that was now wine, not knowing where it had come from, though of course the servants knew, he called the bridegroom over. And so I want us to pause before we look at what he says to the bridegroom. Because there's two points that I want us to pick up on this story so far. The first is that it's not entirely clear what it is that Mary is asking Jesus to do. We read this story as a miracle story. We anticipate and know that a miracle is going to occur. And so when we read Mary's request, we assume that she is asking Jesus for a miracle. But the text itself doesn't tell us that. She may, in fact, have in mind a more practical solution. She may be saying, Jesus, why don't you and your friends that are standing around go to the store and buy some wine, and we can solve this problem of this wedding. We don't know what she's asking in the text. But what she's asking Jesus isn't as important as how she's asking him. Because what we see in the story is that she has such confidence that Jesus will resolve the issue however he will, that she turns around and leaves and tells the servants, do whatever he asks you. Mary puts no stipulations on how Jesus is to resolve the situation. But at the same time, she has full confidence that he will resolve it. The other thing that is interesting about this story is that when we think about it, it's a miracle story. When I said we're going to study the wedding in Cana at the beginning of this sermon, some of you may have known what that story was. But if I had said we're going to study the miracle of Jesus turning water into wine, most of you would have known what that event is. As we read this, it's a miracle story to us. But I want to challenge you to pause for just a minute. If you have your text in front of you and you can look at the whole story, I want you to try to read through this story for yourself. And I want you to pinpoint the verse where the miracle happens in this story. Because you'll be surprised. For it being a miracle story, it's almost impossible to identify a miracle. Now, I grew up watching David Copperfield on TV. I'm sure that some of you did as well. And the thing that is amazing about David Copperfield isn't so much his magic as it is his ability to take a 15-second magic trick and to turn it into an hour-and-a-half-long TV program. <laughs> it's a 15-second magic trick that's accompanied by music and sound and smoke and choreography 
and strange wardrobe choices and 80s and 90s puffy hair, right? It all builds up to this big event. When David Copperfield does a magic trick, he's building the audience up to hype and anticipation so that at the moment that the magic trick finally occurs, it's a miracle. It's instant. It's magic. What you were expecting to happen didn't happen, and what you thought was impossible has already happened. The miracle in John chapter 2 is not that. The miracle in John chapter 2 does not happen to flash and to sound. It doesn't happen with panaz. It doesn't have sound. It, it doesn't have excitement or energy or smoke or mirrors. The miracle in John chapter 2 almost happens in a whisper. And if you're not careful, and if you're not paying attention, you wouldn't even know that the miracle had occurred. And as we read in this story, it's only the people who are attuned to what Jesus is doing who realize that a miracle has even happened at all. And so we pick up with what the master of ceremonies says to the bridegroom in verse 10. He called the bridegroom over and he said, a host always serves the best wine first. And then when everyone has had a lot to drink, he brings out the less expensive wine. But you have kept the best until now. The master of ceremonies is praising the bridegroom, ironically, for something the bridegroom doesn't even know has happened. But he's praising the, the bridegroom based on what is normal practice and logic. And what he's referring to isn't necessarily a Jewish custom. As far as we know, there's no Jewish custom to serve good wine first and bad wine second. There's no Roman or Greek custom to do this. What he's referring to is the simple logic of a situation. That if you have two types of wine, one better than the other, and you have to serve one of them first, do you serve the good wine first or do you serve the bad wine? You serve the good wine and you make a good first impression. And you hope, fingers crossed, that by the time the good wine has run out, They've had enough of the good wine that they won't realize they're now drinking bad wine. And so what he's referring to is the logic behind this principle. And he's praising the bridegroom because he hasn't done what is typical and normal. But what the master of ceremonies does for us as readers of this story is that he actually points out to us what I think is the key theme of this entire story. And the key theme of this story is that when God acts in the world, it reverses the logic of the world. And that when God acts, it changes the way that you think things should typically be. And it creates something new and something different. What the steward also does for us in this story, if we're careful readers, is he raises our attention to the fact that this story isn't actually a comfortable story. This story is full of confusion. When we read it as comfortable readers who have read it many, many times, it makes sense to us and it flows together. If we were reading this with fresh eyes for the very first time, just think of the setting that this story has presented to us. It's a wedding that has ran out of refreshments for their guests. If anyone has ever attended a wedding, you know that that would be a serious situation. If you've ever watched reality TV, you know that weddings that do not go according to plan can be disasters. And so from the very beginning, this story wants us as readers to be uncomfortable and to know that something unexpected is happening. And the steward keys us into this. The other thing that happens in this story to enhance the confusion is that there's an element of delay throughout this story. That Mary asks Jesus to help with a problem that the wedding has, and Jesus immediately responds and says, yes, mother, I will do whatever I can to help. No. No. Jesus perhaps shows his humanity here better than anywhere because he responds as a child responds to their mother and he disagrees with what she asked him to do. And so the initial confusion of what Mary has asked and what Jesus does introduces a delay into the story. The other delay that comes is the delay of the miracle itself. I asked you to pinpoint the miracle for me. And I think if we did a poll, you would all point to different verses. Because the fact is that we don't know when the miracle occurs. And we as the readers are left waiting until the masters of ceremony actually taste the wine, the water that has become wine, for us as readers to actually know that a miracle has happened. There's the reversal of logic that we've already talked about. But another reversal that happens in this story that is a lot more subtle is the reversal of authority 
and the reversal of knowledge and power. That the people at the wedding who should be the first people to know that the wine has ran out aren't aware of it. The people at the wedding who should know where the wine has come from are unaware of it. The people who are in charge of this wedding have no idea what is happening. And the people who do know what is happening, the story tells us, are the servants who carry the water to the headmaster. It's only the people at the lower echelon of the story who know what God is doing and who are aware of it. And then the last aspect that introduces confusion into this story for us is the aspect of anticipation. We said that D David Copperfield builds anticipation through suspense and, and, and music and all of those things. This story builds anticipation by introducing the reason that Jesus will not act, but not telling us what it means. Jesus says, my hour has not yet come. And what my hour means in the Gospel of John is that it's a constant pointer forward to Jesus' crucifixion, his death, his burial, and his resurrection. And so for some reason in this story, Jesus connects what's about to happen with the anticipation that the reader now feels about his coming death. But to add to the confusion, Jesus refuses Mary's request, and then he turns around and doesn't. So we're left as readers to consider how it is and why it is that Jesus does this. And I think what we see in this story is that God has an appointed time when he will act definitively for his people. There is a time in the future that we look forward to when we know that God will change this world and that he will change our lives and that we will live in existence with him. But simultaneously, this story tells us that because God has an appointed hour in the future, it does not prevent him from acting now in the present. And so Jesus puts off initially the work that he's asked to do, but he acts now to help those who are in need. And so we find ourselves in the same situation that the author of this gospel and the authors of all of the gospels find themselves. And that is that we are living at a time that has fallen in the overlap of the ages, we might say. We live in the present time where we can't escape our lives. We can't escape the world that we live in. But we also simultaneously live in the future. And we live in anticipation of what it means for the kingdom to come to its fullness. But we live in anticipation and realization of what the kingdom is already doing now. And so our present and our past and our future overlap with one another. And we live in this tension. But we can't abandon the present. We can't abandon the present and live only in the future. As the song says that we often sing, this world is just my home, I'm just a passing through. It has to be a passing through, not passing. It's a passing through, right? But the reality is that this world is our home. We are just passing through, but this world is our home. John chapter 1 that we studied several weeks ago makes this explicit point that God became flesh and dwelt, lived, made his home among us. And so we can't live only in the future, but at the same time, we can't live only in the present. To live only in the present is to ignore the whispers of God's miracles and what he's doing in this world. And we live in this tension. I think a perfect illustration of it is this tension that we live in right now in this season. It's the reason why I have to explain to my three-year-old that he can't open his Christmas presents. And we have a debate about this quite frequently. Why? Because... I tell him, it's not yet Christmas. But he looks around the house, and he sees Christmas trees, and he sees Christmas lights, and he hears Christmas music, and he sees presents wrapped under the tree. And he asked me the other day, do we wait until snow's on the ground? <laughs> and I was tired of the debate, so I said yes. <laughs> so I hope that it doesn't snow before December 25th or I'm in trouble. But it's confusing for a three-year-old that we are presenting all of the signs of what's already coming, but it's not yet here. And that's the reality that we live in now. That we live in our present, we hope for the future, and we recognize that both of them are overlapping. There's a perfect illustration of this actually built into this story. That when we think about this story as being the miracle of water that's turned into wine, 
We miss that when the steward tastes what's brought to him, the liquid that is brought to him is not called wine. It doesn't say that he tasted the wine and it was good. It says that he tasted the water that had become wine. The miracle in this story retains both features of what it was and what it has become. And when the old and the new encounter each other, it results in transformation. And I think that's important for us to realize as we think about our Christian faith, as we think about our own personal walk. Because I think what we want to do is we want to come and we want to stand in front of the church and we want to say, I'm Zane McGee and I'm a Christ follower and that's all you need to know about me. But we don't often want to stand in front of the church and say, I'm Zane McGee and I'm a sinner and a Christ follower. We don't want to stand beside Jasmine this morning who got up in front of us and said, I'm a person in recovery and I'm a Christ follower. I'm an addict and a Christ follower. I'm a liar and a cheat and a Christ follower. Can I hear an amen? amen. I'm jealous, I'm angry, I'm hateful, I'm an adulterer, I'm an alcoholic, I'm a liar. I'm bitter, I'm sad, and I'm a Christian. Because if we deny this old, what we end up doing is we end up denying that the wine ever was water to begin with. And if we deny that, there's nothing miraculous about this story. If it's a story about how Jesus goes to the store and buys wine and brings it back to the party, that's not worth remembering. What's worth remembering here is that it was wine that has become water. And so when we deny our own past and the transformation that has happened, we do two things. We deny, that God, we deny God the glory that he deserves for the transformation that he has brought in our lives. We deny God the glory of saying that I once was water, but now I have been transformed into wine. And the other thing that we do is we deny the world a witness of what it actually looks like when water is transformed into wine. We deny the world a witness of what it looks like when our human bodies become the place where God's newness interacts with this world. And so we have an obligation to participate in the transformation that we see and to acknowledge that transformation has taken place so that others might benefit from seeing it as well. I want us to reflect on a story real quick. This is a story of Paul Kalanathi, who is an author. He wrote a book called When Breath Becomes Air. And what this book is about is Paul is a neurosurgeon, and this book is a reflection on his journey to becoming a neurosurgeon. It's a reflection on this journey that began actually with an interest in literature and philosophy. And Paul began studying literature and philosophy as a young man. And as he began working his way through these degrees, he worked his way up to a graduate degree in this. And he said that he realized after completing a master's degree in philosophy that he had no moral right to make claims about the importance of life if he wasn't willing to have a stake in what life meant. And so he changed careers. He moved to be a doctor and eventually moved into neurosurgery. And what's so captivating about Paul's story is that in his final year of residency of his, his program in neurosurgery, he was diagnosed with cancer. He was diagnosed with lung cancer that he, being a doctor, already knew was in a bad situation. And his doctors confirmed that it had metastasized and spread throughout his body. And so he writes this book as a reflection on what it means to be someone who has spent their life trying to give life to others and now be faced with his own death. And he says this as an observation in the book. He says, I began to realize that coming in such close, close contact with my own mortality had changed both nothing and everything. And he says in later paragraph that it changes nothing because he knew two things before he was diagnosed. He knew that he would die and he didn't know when it would be. And after being diagnosed with cancer, he knew that he would die and he didn't know when it would be. So the facts of his life had not changed at all, but everything about his life had changed. His vision of what his career would be, his relationship to his job, his relationship with his wife 
and his relationship with his newborn daughter. All of it changed because of the knowledge he was aware of what the future held for him. This story in John chapter 2 is about a miracle that changes nothing but changes everything. To the people at the party who are participating and drinking the wine upstairs, this miracle changes nothing. But to the people who are aware of what Jesus is doing, it changes everything. The story ends in verse 11 by saying that the disciples who had witnessed this believed in Jesus after these events. And so we're left with this question of what it means to participate in God's work in the kingdom, in the present, right now. And there's perhaps no better leading into the Lord's Supper than this story about a festivities and a meal that has wine provided by Jesus. And so we're going to do that now. We're going to lead into the Lord's Supper. And what I want you to think about as we go into this is to think about what it means for us to participate in this meal that for anyone outside of this room means nothing. If it is anything, it is a horribly insufficient snack. But for us, it means everything. We participate in the body and the blood of Christ, and by participating in it, we recognize that God's transformative power is already at work in this world. And then I want us to think about what it means for us to leave this place, having participated in this meal, and to leave as the servants who carry the water that has turned to wine out into the world and who let others taste it. And as the steward said, it is good, but he has no idea where it's come from. And so as we go out into the world, others taste this meal that we're now participating in, and they don't know where it comes from, but they know that it's good. And it allows us to invite them to participate in this with us. We pray with you. Dear Heavenly Father, we come and we thank you. We thank you for transformation that takes place in each of our individual lives. We thank you that that transformation of individual lives means transformation of your church. And we thank you that transformation of your church means transformation of the world. As we gather at this table, we thank you for your son. We thank you that as he faced his hour, he didn't pull back from it that he embraced it so that we might benefit from it and so that we might be transformed by it. We know that this meal is a recognition of how Christ has already acted for us. It's an anticipation of how we know that Christ will act for us in the future and it's participation in his work that is ongoing now. We ask that you would bless this church. We ask that you would bless this church with ears so that we might hear how it is that you are acting in this world. It's in Jesus' name that we pray these things.